Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, part of the delay, I'm afraid it's my fault. So I apologize. Very late in the, in the, in coming here, but I'm very happy to have managed this for a long time uh, to discuss with you uh, our and also uh, other group work uh, on the motor orientation. Um, so actually, here you see a picture that uh, already gives you an idea of what uh, we mean with the motor orientation. You see a picture that uh, reminds you a bit of the photographer who's fine on the back. So, but this is actually a laboratory. This is one of our laboratories. Uh, it's not uh, a picture, but the laboratory looks very much like this. In this laboratory, you see a treadmill that you have uh, virtual reality. And uh, especially, you can see that you have robotic uh, arms external to the circuit, but also in this case, the four robotic arms mounted uh, on the neck of the circuit. And um, in this laboratory, in other laboratories, uh, uh, in our department, uh, we try to control these additional uh, robotic arms uh, together with the natural degrees of freedom uh, of the human. So, the idea is to find uh, neural resources that uh, would allow to extend uh, your bones, to extend uh, your motor abilities. And with motor augmentation, we indeed uh, uh, mean uh, uh, exactly that, so increasing uh, the motor capacities uh, of the body. And we see that this means many things. And in this lecture, I will have the first part, uh, uh, the first half an hour, 45 minutes, uh, gives you a sort of a taxonomy and definitions. Uh, and uh, specific examples. And then the second part, we'll go a bit more into our own research with these uh, main debates on interfacing uh, uh, motor nerves. For doing that, uh, uh, I have some disclosure to, to make. Uh, I have some uh, research and financial involvement uh, with uh, uh, some companies. I won't uh, read it there, but uh, please uh, take this into account uh, when uh, the process was uh, uh, what I tell you. All right, and say that, that this is our agenda. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit long, but we'll try to go through it uh, in the uh, less uh, any possible way. But if you have any questions also during the lecture, please uh, uh, interrupt me. We can do this uh, as uh, interactive as you want. So we start with, uh, with a very brief introduction of what is uh, uh, motor augmentation. So here you can see uh, some other systems similar to the one that you've seen in my um, uh, first slide that can be considered uh, as uh, systems to augment uh, motor capacities. Here you see, for example, uh, a, a sixth finger that is a robotic finger uh, attached to the end. Uh, here you can see two additional ends. And uh, here you can see something similar to what you've seen in the first slide. So all these are robotic systems that you can attach in your body, and uh, they can uh, support uh, the normal motor function. For example, uh, in this case, you see an application in which the two robotic arms are holding uh, a piece that has to be uh, operated and worked on, and then the user is using his uh, natural lens to uh, make some uh, constructions on that, uh, on that piece. Mm -hmm. All right, so these are uh, examples. Uh, um, if we go a bit more uh, uh, in detail, so you can think at a number of ways, right, to do motor orientation. If you say increasing motor capacity, so you can think of a number of ways. Uh, this uh, is what uh, mainly we have seen so far. So uh, extending the number of degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. When you have external robotic arms, uh, as in this case, is, uh, as in this case, that uh, uh, extend the number of degrees of freedom of the human body. So you can attach the human body robotic parts, and these robotic parts uh, will increase your degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly the orientation, right? You have more degrees of freedom to work on. For example, you have two additional arms, or you have one additional arm when you're doing a certain, a certain operation. Mm -hmm. So this is what uh, we call degrees of freedom augmentation. Mm -hmm. It's not the only type of augmentation we can do, right? You can do also. Uh, simple type of augmentation. For example, we can have a power augmentation. We increase, uh, we can increase the power of a certain task. Mm -hmm. An example is uh, an exoskeleton. If you mount an exoskeleton on the arm of a person, 
the exoskeletal can support that function and can increase the power of the person when it's uh, is able to observe. So that's what we call power augmentation. You can also have a, a workspace augmentation. You can extend the spatial reach of natural limbs. It is a very simple case of augmentation, right? You have a stick that uh, uh, allows to grant project at a certain distance. So you extend the the, the, uh, the motor space. You can also have precision augmentation. You can make a task in a more precise way. For example, you can reduce the natural variability in uh, in uh, in motor command. So these are the main uh, the main types of uh, of augmentations that uh, that we will uh, that we will discuss. We focus a lot uh, on extending the use of freedom because it has uh, interest in uh, neuroscientific questions in terms in, in, in addition to applications. Uh, but we will also give example at least for the power augmentation, which is uh, uh, which is also uh, possible with uh, with robotic devices. Okay, which are the applications? Uh, uh, applications of augmentation, uh, in principle, there are many. Uh, here you can see uh, a number of them, but some are a bit futuristic, uh, some others uh, are uh, uh, interesting from the medical point of view. So you may have, for example, a surgeon who operates uh, on, uh, uh, on a certain patient, and uh, normally a surgeon requires an assistant. But you may also have a robotic arm which is controlled in some ways by the surgeon, for example, with uh, a clinical of ENG. And the difficulty, of course, is to have at the same time the natural control of the end and uh, the additional control of this, uh, of this arm. Mm -hmm. Then you can also have uh, in the construction chains, as we have seen before, uh, or you can uh, have uh, in uh, more end-to-end uh, applications, you can have patients who require uh, extension of limbs, for example, because their own limbs are paralytic. So these are some of the applications. This is a review papers that uh, uh, we brought the Imperial College together with the, with the colleagues from uh, uh, the University that provides you a good uh, uh, set of definitions and a good uh, indication of applications. Okay. So now, somehow, we know what is uh, motor augmentation. So now, somehow, we know what we will, uh, we will talk about. And so, uh, let's make uh, a, a very uh, preliminary example, which is also very specific. Mm -hmm. It's an example to enter into the field of augmentation uh, in, uh, by using a field that is a bit more common knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we've seen that one kind of augmentation is power augmentation. Mm -hmm. And one way to have power augmentation would be to uh, substitute uh, natural limbs uh, with robotic parts, right? If you have a robotic end, for example, you can have as much force as you want. So that would be a bionic substitution, and that would uh, increase uh, your motor capacities. Mm? It can also be a faster end, right? it can be more precise. Mm? So we start from this very specific example. And then we go on uh, in a uh, maybe broader perspective. All right. So this video example is bionics. What is bionics? Uh, bionics you see in this uh, graphical uh, rendering. The aim of bionic substitution is to create a uh, symbiotic replacement of missed or damaged parts of the human body with artificial limbs. And uh, of course, the idea is that these artificial limbs uh, are felt uh, and controlled as natural limbs. Mm -hmm. So now uh, we do bionic substitution in patients that have amputations, but as we will discuss, in principle, uh, if you are in developing technology, you can imagine uh, healthy individuals who are uh, go undergoing substitution of body parts in order to be augmented. And that's what we are, we are going on with this, uh, with this discussion. Okay, so for example, bionic hands. Bionic hands uh, are currently controlled in various ways uh, by patients. Uh, and um, we know this is not a, a, a bionic hand to be mounted on a patient, this is a robotic hand. But it's just to show you that we know that from the robotic point of view, we can build uh, better hands than natural hands. We can build hands that are faster, that are more precise, certainly that are stronger, right? So this is just an autonomous robot that is doing a task mimicking, uh, mimicking a human. Mm -hmm. 
So we can do ends, we can do other body parts. That's what the robotic will do. We are superior to the robotic component parts. What is the issue that uh, still impedes us from taking this part and mount this, this one, this uh, robotic part in an individual? So, well, that an individual is seek to control it, or even the patient is seek to control it, right? So now I give you an extreme example of how big the problem is of the, of the control. It's the same robot or a very similar robot as before. The only difference now is that this robot is controlled by this lady who has a brain implant. And uh, she's using her brain signals to control this uh, robotic car. Mm -hmm. So now what does this video tells you with respect to the previous one that despite uh, uh, this uh, patient has some control of this robotic car, the level of control is much inferior than what you've seen before, right? So this is a problem in your interface. If we had better neural interface, then if we could uh, ideally interface robotic parts with a separate system of uh, humans, uh, we could substitute the uh, empty parts and have uh, better humans in terms of uh, motor action. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is what uh, we can currently do with patients. Uh, and this is, a, a, this is a video of some years ago when uh, uh, Silva, myself, and others were in Germany. So this is a German lab. Uh, was our issue at the time. And uh, this is what we can do in terms of biotic substitution in patients. Uh, it is reasonably good, uh, as you can see, but uh, of course, none of you could have uh, use or have uh, and uh, amputated in order to have a system like this, I guess, right? All right, so the reason is that we are very far from what is the dream, or the bionic dream. Uh, the bionic dream is really uh, full integration uh, of robotics from the also from the mechanical point of view, integration of the skeletal system mm -hmm. and uh, rotation, extension, or sleeping, and the perfect control as if these were uh, natural ends. Mm -hmm. So now the, the question though is that we cannot do that now. Uh, I, don't, I don't have to convince you about that, but whoever of you who works in this field knows that uh, we are very far from that dream. But I mean, what if? Uh, uh, in the future, whenever, 20, 30, 50 years, 100 years, we will arrive at doing bionic limbs that are superior to the natural limbs, both in the robotic components and those in the interface. Mm -hmm. So it's a reasonable question, right? That we can pose ourselves, because uh, it's not important we arrive, that we will arrive at that, at that point. Mm -hmm. So at that point, we have to ask ourselves, well, would that be ethically acceptable that people have uh, their biological parts and the human biological parts? It basically becomes silent. I mean, if the biological parts are superior and if they are not uh, uh, drawbacks, then uh, it may be a reasonable thing, right? Of course, it's a big uh, bioethical problem. What I will show you is uh, a study that is the closest now. Let me explain to you why I consider this study a, a, a real augmentation study in terms of bionics, probably the only one. And this study is the following. Here you see a patient who has a brachial plexus injury. Brachial plexus is at the shoulder level. It's the set of nerves that goes down to innervate the full arm and allow us to control the arm. So bracket lessons can be damaged when you have an injury at the shoulder. This is something that happens very often in motor bike accidents, for example. And uh, the problem is that because the nerves are crashed, and those nerves are controlling the full arm, these patients undergo a number of the surgery, and uh, normally they recover the elbow and the shoulder fashion, but very rarely they can recover the end fashion. And this is a typical case. This patient is a young patient. And this patient at the time of this video was in this condition for 15 years. Mm -hmm. So there is no biological recovery. Mm -hmm. But there is an end. Mm -hmm. There is a biological end there. Mm -hmm. Still, it's a non working end, but there is a biological end. Mm -hmm. So now, currently, there is no solution. So all the nerve surgery has been done, and there is no, no solution for this patient for many others. Mm -hmm. And so some years ago, this is a, 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 a leaflet from 2010, so quite some years ago, uh, Professor Asman in uh, Vienna 
Uh, would that be simple? Would you discuss if uh, it was ethically acceptable in this patient so to cut the head and to send it to the level of the front? Now, now you understand why I'm talking about the meditation. That is not a pressure head, but it's just a matter of uh, the level of our technology, right? Because now we can ask ourselves if technically correct is to the end in these patients, but if we are the only which is a bit better, we would ask. Uh, is it ethically correct to remove the end to patient of Lexington? And if we have technology that is more and more advanced, we could say, would we substitute the biological end in the patient with the And then you are right to get the case, right? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, at these uh, times, with our current technology, uh, the closest that we have to uh, augmentation uh, in a bionic perspective. Mm -hmm. So this was important to discuss these ethical questions. There were a number of people involved from different fields, and uh, it lasted uh, uh, a few days. And uh, the, uh, the proposal was indeed to have the biological end and move it and substitute it with the, with the mechanical, uh, with the robotic end that was available at that time. Mm -hmm. And so the answer was yes. Uh, the answer from that uh, ethical uh, meeting was yes. It was uh, it was um, ethically acceptable for the, with the agreement of the patients. And so the 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 operation was the following. Here is the patient with the end that cannot move. But this is the brachial place, by the way, and uh, the end is removed. This is starting to be a robotic end. Then the patient still has to control the aerobic end. And uh, because uh, the signals from the nerves are incongruent, but they are non coherent, the signals from the nerve cannot be used for interfacing. But we can uh, uh, at least extract uh, a very basic signal from one of the nerves that is working. You don't need uh, a very precise one, you just need a basic signal. And then in this case, uh, a piece of muscle was transplanted from the leg of the patient. And uh, put the uh, next to the nerve so that the nerve could connect to this muscle. And then from this muscle, we record the electrical activity to control the organ. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, bionic substitution. And that's bionic substitution of a body part that is existing, is anatomic and there. And it's uh, a bionic substitution that uh, implies augmentation, at least augmentation with respect to the to this specific end, which is the pathological end, it cannot be moved. Mm -hmm. Right, so the idea is uh, uh, similar to nerve transfer and, uh, and fitting with robotic parts. So you take, uh, what I just explained, is that you take nerves and you try to make them reinnervating with muscle tissue, and then you use muscle tissue uh, to interface, for example, with methods that you have heard about uh, earlier this morning. Right, so this is one of the patients, and uh, these were the surgical drawing. And so here you can see Mott means motor. Uh, that was the part where the motor were, were being housed, and this was the amputation plan. Mm -hmm. All right, here is uh, what the patient could do. It's a very short video with his own hand. And then uh, after one year of uh, electric amputation, uh, interfacing and rehabilitation, here is the patient with his, uh, with his robotic hand. So his robotic hand now is uh, an augmented hand with respect to, to his own hand. And here you can see another of these patients. It was a, a case series of three patients. And these are these patients using uh, his robotic hand. He's using his robotic hand just for support, as you can see. But this is far superior than what he could do with uh, his previous hand. All right? And these were uh, just uh, some of the media appearances. And this one uh, is uh, an interesting one, right? So they basically become cyborgs uh, after getting to the body care. And the difference with respect to patients who are amputated is that this patient had a part removed, voluntarily removed, mm -hmm. right? So this was a sort of an introductory example to augmentation. As I said, the main message is that uh, it's just a matter of where we are, we are at with the technology. Uh? If in 20 years we will have a perfect neural interface with a perfect robotic parts, then you may have to ask this ethical question, not for patients who have the end, but for each of us. 
And then you would have to ask uh, who is getting what, why, and what are the etiquette. Okay. So as I said, though, this was a very specific example of uh, of augmentation. Mm? It was a sort of a introductory example because it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting case. Let's now go on uh, by looking at augmentation uh, by increasing the number of degrees of freedom. So the one that we have discussed that so far in Bionis is an augmentation that relates to power, for example, because you can make a robotic hand uh, stronger or velocity, you can make a robotic hand faster and so mm. Now, one uh, of the areas of augmentation that has attracted most uh, interest from the research point of view is uh, increasing the number of degrees of freedom, so making the body an extended body. Mm. For example, having a third arm or a six finger or four legs. Mm. All right, so let's start uh, with uh, another example, which is a specific example again, but this one is an example of augmentation of more than the normal degrees of freedom, and you will see it in a moment. So first, uh, from now on, then we will focus on these. Uh, remember the taxonomy, the taxonomy of augmentation is all these. We have discussed a bit about this part, uh, and now we will focus mainly on increasing the number of degrees of freedom. All right, how do you increase the number of degrees of freedom? Well, increasing the number of degrees of freedom is easy. Uh, you just uh, build uh, robots uh, and, uh, and you have uh, robots uh, worn by subjects, right? And you can have uh, arms, fingers, legs, and uh, you can connect them in various ways. So it can also be external, external robots. The difficult part is to control them, right? The difficult part is how, how, how do we practically control it. There are three main strategies that are uh, currently uh, investigated. One is uh, so-called autonomous augmentation, meaning that uh, you may have uh, uh, robotic parts uh, either mounted on the subject or external that makes their task completely autonomously by supporting the user. Mm? For example, you can have computer vision, you can have an additional alarm, that is looking at the, the working environment and support the user completely autonomously. Mm -hmm. There is another type of uh, augmentation, which is augmentation by transfer, which is a rather simple uh, uh, approach. Uh, it's basically a transfer of degrees of freedom. For example, uh, a surgeon can control this additional uh, visual arm by a pair. Mm -hmm. That's quite simple, right? What you are doing in reality is not to add to the number of degrees of freedom you can control, but you are reproposing specific degrees of freedom. In this case, you are reproposing the degrees of freedom on the ankle in order to control this robotic car. Mm -hmm. That's what we call it augmentation by transfer. Mm -hmm. And then there is uh, the most complex one, augmentation by extension, meaning that you really extend your body and you extend your nervous system, uh, being able with your nervous system to control the additional body parts. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is uh, uh, this is the most uh, the most complex one to uh, to achieve. It is the most complex one because it opens fundamental scientific questions. So it's not only an engineering uh, uh, task, but it's also a neuroscientific uh, 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 challenge. Mm -hmm. Because once you say, well. Let's have an additional arm, for example. That's fine. We can build a third robotic arm. We can mount it on your body. We can make it light, and uh, we just wear it. But uh, but then uh, we ask your brain to control it in some ways. Mm -hmm. So how do you do? Well, before uh, asking how do you do, you should ask yourself: uh, Is the human brain even able to do that? Right. I mean, after all, we have. Uh, evolved for a million of years with a certain body, maybe the brain is not able to control more than what we have, right? We don't know the answer to this question, by the way. Uh, the, 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 the work in human meditation is trying to answer also this question. Actually, trying to answer mainly these questions, and then the technology can come. Mm -hmm. But it, even if it is, uh, even if it is uh, able, even if the brain is able to do that, would that uh, enhance the functional abilities? Mm -hmm. And which kind of neural representation would underlie the control of uh, these so-called supernumerary body parts, or additional body parts? Which kind of representation the brain would have of these body parts? Would these, would these body parts uh, be part of the body scheme of the brain after a while? 
if you, if you had the etheric dark and you manage uh, with your brain to control it for a long time, would you see that as part of your body? Yeah, so these are all questions of pure neuroscience, right? And uh, there are questions that actually come as quest at the very beginning of this type of investigation. Okay, so I say we start from an example um, that relates to these questions. Huh? All these questions about uh, are we able or is our brain able to, to do that? And this is an example which is also very specific. Yeah? There is an example of an acronym. There are a few people uh, in the world uh, who are born uh, with the six uh, fully working, uh, fully working fingers. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, uh, polydactyly as a as a condition, and uh, and these people have been studied by Kasten Mering uh, and the Cambridge the Cambridge is in Imperial College, Kasten Mering uh, at uh, uh, Freiburg University. Mm -hmm. And uh, Etienne and Carsten were interested in these uh, uh, subjects uh, because they have a natural unmented body. So how does their brain control that uh, additional finger? Does it control it or it is just there for support? Is it a real motor control and, it, and does it provide functional benefits? Hmm? So in this study, which is a very nice uh, reading, uh, if you have the time, they studied the two of these uh, uh, individuals uh, from a number of perspectives, mm? from the fMRI perspective, uh, from the anatomical perspective, and so on. So here you can see uh, a, an image of the bone structure and muscle, and actually to control the additional finger, they have additional muscles. So they have specific muscles that control those extra fingers. Mm? So the brain is to control something else uh, with respect to uh, other individuals with the, with five fingers. And um, here you can see a, a video where you can see that the additional finger, which is uh, in the middle there, in a moment you will see that it can uh, uh, produce a pinch, so it can oppose with uh, the other fingers, as you can see there, right? So the additional finger can uh, oppose with any of the other fingers, can do a pinch with any of the other fingers. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, functionally used, but it's not just uh, and uh, an appendix. Mm -hmm. And here is, uh, you see now the, the opposition of the additional finger, and with all the finger suction. Huh? Then this is uh, a study of a sort of a proprioception. So uh, the, the feeling of the position of the end. So you cover the end and you ask the individual to point where your fingers and thumbs are. Huh? And here is uh, uh, these uh, blue uh, little dots uh, are the error that uh, five digit uh, individuals will make. And the triangles are the two individuals with six fingers in terms of error in locating the parts of the end. And it's fully comparable. Huh? So it's fully integrated into the proprioceptive system. They have uh, the, the, the feeling of the six fingers in space uh, as uh, uh, we have uh, the feelings of our. Uh, Five, uh, five digits. Mm -hmm. And here is interesting, this is, a, this is a brain imaging uh, mm -hmm. showing the position uh, in the motor cortex uh, related to the control of fingers. Uh. And these are examples of, uh, uh, of uh, location in five finger study. It doesn't matter the scale, it's just to, to give you an idea of the relative position in the motor cortex. But then the main uh, the point is that the six finger is, uh, is uh, which is the supernumerary finger, is uh, very well separated from the others. And is, is fully represented as, as the others. Mm -hmm. So the brain is fully representing that, uh, that finger. Uh, it's fully part of the, of the body skin. And then uh, uh, you, you would ask, well, uh, do they really use the additional degrees of freedom? Uh, and here, in these uh, matrices, uh, here you have, uh, again, uh, videos showing uh, uh, this patient. Now you have uh, a recording of all the joint angles. And this further experiment was done to look at how many degrees of freedom they are using. Uh, and this is, this, um, um, these uh, maps are uh, a, an idea of the mutual information between the fingers used. Uh, so that's a sort of indication of how independently they use the fingers, 
And they're fully comparable, the six figure with the five different individuals. Mm -hmm. And when you count the degrees of freedom they use in a very complex manipulation task, here you can see, on average, they have more degrees of freedom that they use functionally than five finger individuals. So they use fully the possibility of the ten. All right? Mm -hmm. So this is a beautiful study, I really suggest it to, to read. Of course, it's a, it's a narrow scientific study. And this study is often cited in terms of augmentation because it tells that the brain may be able to deal with additional body parts. Now, of course, this is the brain of people who were born with these additional body parts. So you can argue, well, maybe the brain really needed to adapt in infancy uh, on, a, on a very long term on this uh, uh, different uh, body. But it can also tell us, uh, well, uh, it, yes, but yet, uh, in principle, it can. Maybe, maybe it needs a lot of time, but in principle, it can. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so that was an example of natural augmentation. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, just check the, yeah, 10 minutes we do the first break, I think, yeah. And then uh, we uh, will uh, go to artificial augmentation, which is really what we want uh, to do. So in prison, what we would like to do is to do something very similar to that six finger. That would be the idea, right? But uh, with the robotic part, so that the robotic part can be added to each of us. Mm -hmm. So we know it would be very difficult to reach that type of augmentation. Right? Here we can, we can try to do that. Okay, so remember, to increase the degrees of freedom, I told you there are um, uh, a few ways. Now, just a few videos on the simple uh, ways. This is fully autonomous augmentation. So these robotic cars are programmed to support uh, a, certain, uh, uh, a certain piece of equipment above the shoulder of the, of the subject. There is no control and no connection with the, with the body. Mm -hmm. It's just to remind you that this is what we call the autonomous uh, augmentation of degrees of freedom, all right? Interesting research area, mm -hmm. relatively simple with respect to what we discussed, right? Maybe we don't have any connection with the nervous system. Mm -hmm. These are examples uh, of uh, augmentation by transfer, where you use other degrees of freedom. Uh? So, for example, this is work uh, of the group of um, uh, Tamir McKean in uh, Cambridge, uh, which is very interesting for the brain representation. They have studied extensively. They have um, a six finger, which is a, a robotic finger, as you see. And uh, the control is at the moment very simple. They use the, the big toe uh, where there is a pressure sensor in order to move that finger. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a clear example of a transfer of degrees of freedom, right? You're not uh, increasing. Uh, the absolute number of functional degrees of freedom because you're using one to control another one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are other examples. This is an example of uh, two robotic cars that are controlled also with pedals. Uh, and this is even uh, from the art field. This is Stellark. For those of you interested, uh, he's an artist uh, who is uh, playing with augmentation since a uh, long time. Actually, this is uh, an old uh, photo of him, probably more than 20 years. And um, he, he builds uh, or he was building uh, uh, this kind of uh, devices. And uh, you can see with the movement of his body parts, uh, then uh, the robotic hand also moves. Mm -hmm. That's uh, for uh, artistic um, kind of performances. We actually invited him at Imperial College. He came and gave uh, two hours, a very exciting uh, uh, and uh, incredible presentation. Mm -hmm. he, he worked with that. Uh, a number of other kinds of, uh, and he worked on this uh, actually well before augmentation became uh, in fashion uh, in, uh, in science. These are uh, more than 20 years ago. All right, so these are all examples of augmentation by transfer. We use other degrees of freedom to, uh, to move uh, additional ones, but the total count from the functional point of view doesn't, doesn't change, right? Well, right, augmentation by extension is increasing the degree of freedom. This is what exactly we, we mean uh, with the with the absolute increase of the number of degrees of freedom and control of those degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. And there are many ways to do that. So this is uh, the idea of arriving at the level of having a six finger like the natural one that we've seen before. Mm -hmm. So this is a study again uh, by the group of Karsten, 
married in Freiburg, uh, and he actually very kindly uh, gave me this uh, slide and a few others. This is uh, a monkey study, and this is a brain computer interface study. And this is uh, a, a very interesting study, again, from the neuroscientific view, because it proves that, in principle, the brain can do additional tasks without compromising our degrees of freedom. So the study is quite complex. I will try to explain to you uh, briefly, and, and, then we, and then we have a break. So these are monkeys. Uh, here you can see a grid of electrodes mounted on the brain. So there is a brain surgery. This is so-called uh, ECOG, electrocorticogram. Uh, and from these uh, electrodes, uh, you can record a relatively good uh, brain signals. Mm -hmm. So in this study, they had um, uh, the monkey having uh, to reach, uh, as you can see, eight targets. Mm -hmm. And the eight targets were reaching, was reached by moving a course horizontally and vertically. Now, the horizontal movement in one side and the other was done by the monkey by pressing buttons, right? So that's the natural degree of freedom, okay? Now, the vertical one, interestingly, was done by the monkey thinking at the pressing buttons, but without doing that. So using the same cortical circuits used for the planning of the motor task concurrently with the actual motor task. So it's like if you think, if you, if at the moment I make it this uh, gesture with the, with the arm, at the same time I think to do that, but I try to control something that is different from the motor control they send to the, that they send to the arm. And they did it in a way by taking the ECOG and uh, looking at uh, a, a band power uh, between 70 and 90. So they look at the power of the ECOG in that band uh, and extracted that power. And that was the vertical, the vertical movement. So here we have uh, at the same time natural movements and mental control of the same task, which is translated in an ortho orthogonal movement of the cursor, right? So the way in which this is translated is doubling those degrees of freedom, right? Instead of going only horizontally, now you go vertical with that, but the mental task is the same. You just take a, a, another specific band in the, in the EQG, all right? So that's a quite brilliant, uh, Study design. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, the monkeys can do that, but especially in order to reach this intermediate core, you see this intermediate uh, uh, target, that means that you have to do both at the same time. Right? You have to do the task that moves it horizontal and the task that moves it vertical. So, to reach this, uh, the monkey has to do that mental task and the real task exactly at the same time. So that means that the, the brain can do concurrently two tasks, even if the body is doing one, right? The body is just pushing the button. Uh, the brain is doing two tasks that are translated into two-dimensional control. All right? So that's beautiful. That indicates that uh, maybe the brain has sufficient plasticity to reach a control of additional uh, part of the body, and so to expand the degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. And this is just uh, exactly what I what I shown you in a in a bit uh, bigger uh, bigger version. Okay, so now we have done all this part, uh, and we will we we'll stop for a break now. We have done all this part, uh, and what we will do in the second part uh, is uh, methods uh, for doing exactly this extension of the motor commands uh, by using uh, uh, spinal motor neural activity. Which link with the other lecture that you have that you have followed. Mm -hmm. All right, let's make the, the next step. It's uh, uh, this part that may be some part of the bit the details of the, the previous parts, but I hope uh, it would fit in context also with respect to the rest of the school. So so far we have uh, so far we have 
introduce more gravitation, we have seen examples of that. And as for now, we only the nation, we will uh, focus on extending the degrees of freedom and so finding uh, narrow resources uh, for the brain to control the uh, new degrees of freedom without inferring uh, the control of the natural degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have seen an example of doing that by direct uh, brain interfacing just before the break. Uh, this was the, the study of the mathematics. Mm -hmm. Now we'll focus on humans uh, and uh, we'll focus on uh, a different type of interfacing. So before uh, we had uh, uh, looked at this type of interfacing, you see this uh, an EcoG grid. And uh, this was the study we just uh, discussed of monkeys. And uh, now we will mainly focus on interfacing motor neurons in the spinal cord. And as you know, motor neurons can be interfaced by measuring muscular activity. Uh, because we have had uh, the previous lecture, we will get much more superior school. Mm -hmm. All right, now, first, uh, uh, as I say, motor neurons are in the spinal cord, uh, and uh, we have to, to, to realize uh, an important thing that the spinal motor neurons are the output uh, of the nervous system, the very fine line. So, if you uh, think uh, that your brain, the spinal cord circuits, uh, has uh, a giant neural network here. Uh, this neural network uh, eventually uh, converges uh, its uh, outputs to motor neurons that then are connected to mass. Mm -hmm. So motor neurons are the last layer of uh, the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is interesting because uh, when you have a very complex system, uh, if you can measure the output, uh, you already have uh, quite a quite different information. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting because motor neurons are connected to muscles and uh, uh, they receive input from the entire nervous muscle system. So motor neuron, the motor neuron can be seen uh, as sort of a sink of synaptic input from the foot system. Mm -hmm. And it uh, will find uh, the motor neuron will find the final common pathway of the nervous muscle system by sharing it on, uh, at the beginning of the last century. Common pathway, common pathway is because everything in the nervous system converges to the motor nerve. Mm -hmm. uh, you can uh, consider the evolution of the nervous system basically as uh, the evolution of a system that is providing coherent information to the cells in order to produce behavior. Mm -hmm. Our nervous system has evolved for us to move, and that's exactly what the motor neurons uh, do when they're connected to muscles. Okay? Now, uh, how many motor neurons are uh, in humans? And then uh, I will uh, explain why I'm asking these questions. This question. mm -hmm. The motor neurons are much more than the muscles, right? So normally when we, when we think about motor control, we think about muscles, but actually we should think about motor neurons. Every muscle is innervated by many motor neurons. And so that means that for the upper limb, for example, if you count the motor neurons as in this study, which is an image study, you will find that there are around 20 pieces of motor neurons. Mm -hmm. To control in a functional task, uh, 20, 30 muscles, right? So there are 30 degrees of freedom more motor neurons than, uh, than uh, uh, muscles. Mm -hmm. So why am I saying that? Because uh, when you look at this number, and from what we discussed about augmentation, you can uh, uh, ask yourself, well, can we just uh, augment the number of degrees of freedom by controlling the uh, individual of the net? I mean, uh, if the nervous system would be able to control 22,000 motor neurons independently, then you would be able to control 22,000 degrees of freedom, right? You can assign a, a motor neuron to the degree of freedom. So that would be quite uh, a dramatic spatial. But it's a method of, uh, it's a method, uh, of uh, neural resources. Can the brain control every single motor neuron independent or not? Mm -hmm. So as I said, it's an important question because uh, if uh, uh, it is able to do that, then we have automatically a neural resource for augmentation. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not able to do that uh, really one by one, not mm -hmm. one by one, let's say that uh, the brain can control a group of groups of motor neurons that are in a larger number of degrees of freedom. That is again 
a source of augmentation, right? So by studying motor nerves, you may look at the source of augmentation, understanding which is the capability of the brain to project on groups or even individual motor nerves. All right, so uh, this is the question, right? Can the motor neuron, can the central nervous system control motor neurons in the pen? Mm -hmm. And that's a question that uh, is equivalent to ask, can the central nervous system dramatically augment the number of neural commands with respect to what is sent to the muscle? Mm -hmm. All right, uh, motor neurons uh, are also quite easy to study. Uh, with, we have read uh, a lot, but these are very basic, uh, very basic slides. We can study motor nerves in humans in vivo. And so it is possible to look at the possibility for the nervous system to control them or not independently, right? So the, the classic way to study motor nerves is to put a needle uh, into a muscle. This is, for example, a concentric needle. And this is the first method that proposed uh, to investigate motor neuron in humans, uh, and this is the paper in 29 when uh, where it was performed. So it's almost a century ago. And that's by Adrian. Adrian, also Nobel Prize by Sherrington uh, for physiology. Mm -hmm. Not for this, but for, for uh, uh, a number of other discoveries. So if you put a needle uh, in the muscle, then you get a signal like this, which is a classic intramuscular EMG signal. And this signal is so selective that you can see the spice of individual motor neurons in the spinal cord. So uh, the needle can be very small. So this is uh, actually, despite your recording from muscle, you are making a neural interface. Because when you get these spikes, so these are the spike in activity coming from the spinal cord, so come, coming from neural cells. Mm -hmm. So we can make a neural interface uh, with motor neurons without surgery. We can just put uh, a, a needle. We can expand this technique. This is work of Sylvia. I wish you would talk about that in this uh, week where uh, you have, um, instead of uh, a, a needle with one recording points, you can have microfilaments with many recording points, in this case, 40 channels, and this uh, structure is put again into a needle that can be inserted into the mass. In this case, you get uh, many intramuscular energy signals, and uh, therefore, you can decode many, many more motor layers. Mm -hmm. And uh, you are hearing about these techniques uh, during this uh, during this group quite quite a lot. So I will not uh, I will not go into detail. Mm -hmm. But just would like to tell you that you can study motor neurons in humans and in vivo relatively simply. And actually, you can even study motor neurons with wearable technology. So with surface EMG, and you have read uh, the previous lecture and many of the lectures to come that you can also identify single motor neuron activity with the uh, recordings that are uh, of this type. Okay. So basically, when you record uh, an EMG, as you have heard before, you have motor neuron activity from the spinal cord. They are transforming into muscle fiber compound potentials. And then the sum of all these uh, is the EMG. This can be intramuscular surface. But from this point, uh, you can go back to the input uh, uh, from the spinal cord to the muscle. Mm -hmm. Right? So uh, from muscle recordings, uh, you can go to the spinal cord. And you can uh, and you can record uh, uh, motor neuron activity. Mm -hmm. So again, since this is a, a school, we we knew the forward model of generation of DMG since the seventies. This is work by De Luca. Carlo De Luca uh, has been the person who has uh, uh, introduced mathematical characterization of uh, EMG. Uh, and so the formalism around EMG. And this is a model that he uh, proposed uh, in the 70s. And actually, from this model, we can build an inverse model. And the inverse model has been developed more recently. The inverse model allows to decode the, the motor neuron activity from the EMG. Mm -hmm. And the model is the same if you have intramuscular surface. Okay. So basically, you can summarize this. You can get a, a view into large population of neural cells in natural, in natural moments. Okay, right. So uh, this is uh, this is just uh, this was just a parenthesis to say that we can do those kind of investigation in humans. Now, how do we do, how do we use it for uh, for augmentation? Mm -hmm. So, well, we can uh, uh, ask the question that we pose. For example, can the nervous system control motor neurons independently? Mm -hmm. 
we call this flexible control. And how do you answer the question? You answer the question by making an experiment. And uh, normally, if you look at the literature, there is always someone else who has thought about that before. And indeed, uh, this has been uh, uh, done in the 60s by John Bass Major. In, and this was published in Science, so that's quite uh, an impactful paper. So John Bass Major, by the way, another pioneer uh, in EMG, and especially in biofeedback techniques. And this study is about biofeedback. John Bass Major was the founder of the uh, International Society for Retrophysiology and Kinesiology and uh, and uh, the mentor of Carlo De Luca. So uh, a person who has contributed uh, extensively to uh, to these techniques. In this study, this is a, a biofeedback study. And it's a simple biofeedback study. So as major put a, a wire electrode into a muscle of the end. And uh, the wire electrode was, was proposed by himself actually after the concentric needle. So this is just a little wire instead of a full needle. The needle is used only to insert the wire. And then this is the oscilloscope where you see the signals recorded by this wire. And these are photographs uh, of the oscilloscope. And you can see this, this uh, action potential. Those are action potential of muscle units that are connected to single motor neurons. And uh, Basmejan asked a very simple question in this study. And the question was, uh, can uh, LT volunteers uh, voluntarily control that motor neuron is the is the feedback in its activity. So what, what he was asking to the scientists was to increase the frequency of these spikes, so making them more often, or decreasing it, so making them less often, uh, by having this biofeedback. So if you do that uh, in, the, in the lab, uh, with any other technique that allows you to record uh, single motor neurons, uh, you will find out that you can do this task immediately. Uh, each of us can do this task immediately. It's very, very easy. You can very easily control uh, a motor neuron uh, in a very precise way. Mm -hmm. And then you can also switch. You can go to another motor neuron. You can control also that one and so on. Mm -hmm. All right, so this was the first demonstration that humans can control voluntarily individual neural cells. And by the way, uh, this uh, Apparent for motor neurons in the spinal cord uh, before uh, it uh, was demonstrated also from the cortex. So you can do the same by having intracortical electrodes and asking uh, individuals to control neurons in the motor cortex, for example. There was then around 10 years after by Abraham Schweitz and other, and that demonstration for the cortex was the beginning uh, of the era of uh, invasive brain computer interface. Mm -hmm. But the motor neuron nerve in the spinal cord, this could be done uh, uh, in a very simple way because you can assess motor neurons in the mass. All right. Okay. So having uh, now seen this paper and having discussed the results, uh, so what is the answer to our question? Can motor neurons be controlled independently? In your opinion. So that's the experiment, and these are the results. Any anyone? Okay, who says uh, the answer is yes? Raise your hand. One. Who says the answer is no? Wait a few more, and then a few undecided. Okay. All right. So this is interesting, actually, because, uh, I mean, in principle, one can be prone to say, well, if I can switch motor neuron and the, and the brain can, can continue to control each of them, but then we are indeed controlling neural cells. Mm -hmm. However, there is uh, a little caveat, and this is uh, a study done, uh, what is it, 60 years after, by Mario Brackley in our labs. Mario Brackley uh, was a PhD student in our lab, now he's working uh, in, uh, in a company. And um, uh, Mario's idea was uh, to extend the study of uh, John Basmation with a very small detail. Mm -hmm. So Mario has recorded the signals from the muscle, which is very anterior, they composed online to have a single motor unit, so it's a bit more advanced technique than the oscilloscope that you have seen, but the concept is the same. And then he identified two units, uh, and then he changed the pair multiple times, but let's say he identified two units, two motor units, so these are the spiking activity of motor neurons, and put the, the firing rate of, uh, so the discharge rate, the R, of one motor unit vertically and the other one horizontally. So when you increase the firing rate, when you increase the firing rate of the first unit, 
the cursor moves in this direction. When you increase the firing rate of the second motor unit, the cursor moves vertically. When you control them together, the cursor will be in this two-dimensional space, right? Okay. Now, why, why uh, did uh, Mario do this? Because the point is that uh, the experiment that was measured showed that you can control motor narrows, but still not that you can do it independently of all the others. Because was measured was looking at one motor narrow at a time. What happens to the others? If you have two, like in this case, can you control them completely independently? What does it mean independently in this experiment? Well, it means that in this two-dimensional space, you can move anywhere. If you can move anywhere, that means that you can, for example, increase the firing of these and decrease the firing of the other one, or increase the firing together. So each of these points in this space is a different state of these two motor units. The idea is that if, uh, if uh, uh, the, the subjects are able to control independent motor nerves, then they even go anywhere here. Mm? And so these subjects were trained to do that. They were trained for two weeks to do that. And were trained to explore all, the, all that space. Mm? Now, the long story made short, if you do that, then you will find out that the subjects can mainly, exclusively, do this. What is this? When the two units are controlled together in the same way, fully correlated. It's very difficult to detach the behavior of those two units. So if you take one at a time, you can control it. If you take the other one, you can control it. But if you take the two together, you can still control them, but not separately. They are glued together. Mm -hmm. So what is happening here? Well, it's happening. It's possible to control single motor narrow, but controlling one motor narrow imposes the behavior of many others. Mm -hmm. It is difficult to dissociate the control among motor narrows, we say, in the same cluster for the moment. So that from, from this experiment, uh, you can have the impression that the nervous system is sending a command to at least a group of motor narrows, and that group is glued together, and it cannot be separated, all right? So because of this, now our potentially 22,000 commands are becoming a bit less. It depends how big are these groups, right? If we have groups of 1,000 narrows, instead of 22,000 commands, we will have 22. Right? If we have groups of 10,000, now we have two commands. Right? Depends how big are these groups. Because within the group, the nervous system cannot dissociate. Okay? But right. is this really surprising? Well, uh, as always, I always say that there is, no, there is no new science. All science is all science revisited. And it is not really surprising what we have seen in that experiment with the two neurons. Because uh, from the 70s already, we knew that if we record from two motor neurons and we study the correlation between these two activities, with a cross correlogram, these two activities are correlated. We know this since uh, 50 years. That was uh, classically uh, named the short-term synchronization. Mm -hmm. So short-term synchronization, which was uh, or say 50 years ago, uh, tells us that there is a correlation between motor neurons. Correlation means a lack of independence, right? Which is exactly what we have seen when we have the biofibre study. Mm -hmm. So the basic code, what is the basic code? The motor neuron receives some common input. In order for the output of motor neuron to be correlated, that means that the nervous system sends a common input. It cannot send separate inputs. So motor neuron receives common input that imposes correlation in the activity of motor neuron. And when you have correlation, the dimensionality of your space of independent control goes down. It depends how many of these clusters that the nervous system addresses you have, right? All right, by the way, there is also another reason for which, well, one reason for which uh, the nervous system sends uh, a common input to many motor neurons is obviously the computational complexity, right? It would be unreasonable uh, to control 20 plus thousand, and if we, we think of full body movements, we talk about uh, hundreds of thousand, individual commands, right? The computational load will be far too high. Mm -hmm. So the first reason to send common input is that uh, the, the dimensionality uh, has to be reduced. Mm -hmm. There is also another reason to send common input, uh, and this is work that uh, together with Francesco Negro we did uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, if you have individual motor narrows, 
and you send a certain command, for example, from the cortex, each of these individual motor neurons will transmit the command in a different way, because each motor neuron from a different way from the others. Because each motor neuron uh, is uh, strongly non-linear, and it has a lot of noise. So if you look at how a, an oscillation like this, which is a 20 Hz oscillation, is transmitted by individual motor neuron, you, uh, you have that each motor neuron transmitted differently, uh, and distorted actually quite a bit. Here you can see peaks are coming out of the non-linearities. Hmm? But if you project a signal commonly to a number of motor neurons, and then you consider the drive that goes to the muscle, then out of all these, the projected signal is transmitted in an almost perfect linear way. So that's uh, another reason why the nervous system has to send a common signal to more than one motor neuron. Each motor neuron is too noisy. It has to project that. This is the same in neuroscience of what you read as population behavior. The motor neurons have to be controlled at the population level in the same way as uh, sensory input also is projected in population of uh, neural cells that are, uh, in that case, uh, sensory population of cells. Mm -hmm. So the motor neurons need to work as a population. Because they need to work as a population, they receive a common input. And because they receive a common input, they are not independently controlled. Because they are not independently controlled, that means that we don't have that many neural signals available as we were thinking at the beginning, right? But how many do we have? So is it true now that uh, one could say, well, fine, but each of these motor neurons, each of these group of motor neurons project in a muscle? That's a classic view, right? You can say a muscle has two, three hundred motor neurons, all of them receive a common input and project to the muscle. If you have this situation, that means that you would have one neural signal for each muscle, hmm? which, by the way, would already mean more than the number of degrees of freedom, because you know that the muscular system is redundant, right? So if it was like that, you would have certainly the possibility of, uh, um, of augmenting the, the human body. Hmm? In reality, it's not exactly like this. It's not exactly like this. In reality, you have, uh, let's say, a number of motor neurons. This project to certain muscles. We will discuss the muscles after. And then these are the common inputs, okay? You can have two, you can have three, you can have four. The number of common inputs define the clusters that are glued together, all right? So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's what happens. By the way, if you decode the motor neuron activity with the techniques we just discussed, you can uh, investigate this common input by looking at the correlation between these motor neurons. You can transform the correlation in a graph where each motor neuron that that uh, receive common input is close to each other. So, for example, here you can see two inputs for this situation. Okay, so experimentally, you can see this. Huh? And experimentally, here yeah, it's an experiment on the lower leg, you can see these uh, graphs looking at the clusters of motor neurons. So, these graphs are read in this way. These motor neurons here are receiving a common input, so they are glued together. If you try to control in that task one of them, you force the behavior of all the others in the, in the cluster, right? And depending on the task, you can have different commands. You see here you have three commands, for example. Every time you have uh, that within the cluster, you cannot separate them. Now, each of those clusters could be one neural command, right, in our case. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that can we extract more neural commands from these clusters than it is possible, for example, from uh, the number of degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. Well, there are a number of options. So one option is that, as I said before, you have that all the motor neurons in the retinal muscle receive a common input, and then the number of independent commands will be the number of muscles. All right? So this is the independent muscle control view. Then you have another view, that is the classic muscle synergy, muscle synergy view, in which every pool in the retinal muscle receive the same number, the same type of common inputs, but you have less common inputs than number of muscles, and these uh, lower number of common inputs are projected to all the pool of motor neurons that are mixed together. This is the muscle synergy view. This is due to started with uh, Bernstein in the 50s. It has been uh, uh, extensively discussed in the literature. 
In this view, you would have less number of commands than number of masses, and uh, although this is not uh, explicitly indicated, you may see this command as corresponding uh, somehow to the of freedom. It's not exactly like that. So in this, uh, in this view, you would have uh, uh, not uh, many extra commands, or maybe not at all. But then you can have, you can have a further view. Uh, this is reviewed uh, in, uh, in, in this recent paper. You can have a further view in which uh, you consider all the motor mirrors independently from the masses, and then you have uh, a certain number of inputs that project in the motor mirrors, but they don't project to the full uh, number of motor mirrors in the the mass, so they can project to a fraction of them, or they can project to a cluster that contains motor mirrors partly from a, one mass and partly from the other. So now you see that the nervous system in this third view does not see muscles. There is no reason why the nervous system should see muscles. The nervous system sees a macro pool of motor neurons, which eventually innervate all the muscles in the task and take clusters of them to produce behavior. Now, in this view, uh, the number of commands that you add depend how big are those clusters, right? Because, for example, a muscle can be fractioned in many parts. In that case, you have more than one command per mass. So in this view, which is actually the current view, you can look for commands that are uh, uh, spare and that can be used for additional external control. Mm -hmm. And this uh, brings you at uh, a synergy theory at the motor neuron level mm -hmm. that tells you the motor neuron uh, have to be grouped in functional clusters, and we discussed why they had to be grouped. There is no other way to control them. These functional clusters correspond to a certain behavior, but the mass and anatomical borders are irrelevant. So the cluster can cross the mass and anatomical borders. The nervous system sees the motor nerves, not the muscles. You remember one of my first slides where you have all that big neural network, which is the brain and the spinal cord circuits, and then you have the motor nerve as the last layer. So that's uh, what the nervous system sees. It sees the last layer of its network. And then, of course, uh, that uh, will be connected to muscle. Muscle will produce behavior, and uh, in a reward-based uh, closed loop, uh, the central nervous system can uh, learn to activate certain clusters with respect to others. Mm. So now this view combines the need for dimensionality reduction and flexibility in control, because now you don't have any more the borders of the muscle. In principle, the nervous system can take any cluster from this big pool, can change the cluster as, as, it, as it wants. Now, why is this important for augmentation? Well, this is a, a fundamental framework for augmentation, because now the question of augmentation is, can we identify, for example, more clusters than degrees of freedom? Can we identify clusters that are spared, meaning that uh, they can be controlled, but they don't have a behavioral counterpart? We, we don't know that. Mm -hmm. Or can we split the cluster in half? and use uh, half for the biological degrees of freedom and the other half for the additional degrees of freedom, maybe with a biofeedback uh, study, similar to the one of us measured. Mm? We, we don't know. This is quite recent research. Mm? But this uh, is a framework uh, that tells you uh, how to look at augmentation from the motor neuron point of view. So there is no way that uh, the single motor neuron can be separated from others. So there is no way that you will find Single motor neurons independently controlled by the nervous system. That's, uh, I believe, is impossible for, for many reasons. But there is the possibility to find cluster of motor neurons that can be independently controlled and that can have a small behavioral impact so that they can be used in additional neural commands. Mm -hmm. And maybe this can be extracted with. Uh, so this is summarized uh, exactly what I, what I what I just said. OK. So this is, uh, uh, this is the framework uh, of studying augmentation by interfacing motor nerves. And with that framework, uh, if you're interested in, the, in this type of studies, you can uh, invent uh, your own uh, studies, right? So for example, one thing we don't know, and I mentioned it uh, a couple of times, is uh, once you identify a cluster, you can do that experimentally, put in a matrix and using the techniques that you have heard this morning, when you identify a cluster, if you give that cluster as a feedback, for example, in a two dimension or three dimension, and you train the subject on uh, weeks or months, 
you split that cluster? Can the brain have the flexibility to separate the control? That's the huge question, right? So you, you, can, you can try to address the question. We are not able to answer the question yet. But this would be a fundamental question for real augmentation. Because at that point, you would have a, a direct uh, additional neural command to control something else. We will finish by discussing again the motor neural network, but something, a, a different approach to look for augmentation. So now we have tried to look at independent control of motor neurons, and now we will look at, a, at, a, at another approach, which I will explain in a moment, and which is related to spectral bandwidth. So this is uh, the, the kind of approach. So here you have uh, the motor neurons, uh, and here you have the muscle, and we know that we record muscle activity. We go back to the motor neuron uh, spiking. The way we, we have discussed this extensively. Mm -hmm. Now the motor neuron spiking, uh, this motor neuron spiking, uh, depends on the input that the motor neuron receives from the entire system. You remember when I said the motor neuron is a sink of synaptic input? It is a sink input from the entire neuromuscular system. So that means that the output of the motor neuron depends on what comes from the brain what comes from the muscle afferents, what comes from the spinal circuit, and so on. Mm? And the motor neurons as a population, if you look at the population level, they will transmit this input. So that means that by looking at the motor neuron output, in principle, you can see the inputs from various parts of the nervous system, because they are at the very end of the nervous system. Mm? So now this is interesting. And indeed, uh, if you do a spectral analysis of the motor neuron output, as uh, seen as done here, so this is a coherence between motor neurons and a certain muscle. What you see is that uh, there is a, a certain level of coherence in the low frequency band, but also in very high frequency bands. All right. And uh, as you can see here, any kind of input at any frequency that goes to the motor neurons will be transmitted at the output of the motor neurons if you have a population behavior. Mm -hmm. So even if you have uh, 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 very high inputs from the cortex, if they go down to the motor neurons, you can estimate them from the motor neuron output. Mm -hmm. All right, why is this, uh, is this plot interesting? Uh, well, because uh, remember, this is the frequency content of the spike trains of the motor neuron. The spike trains will go to the muscle, right? Okay, what is the bandwidth of a muscle? What is the... the, the the maximum frequency a muscle can, can operate? Approximately. Yeah, around 10 hertz, right? 10, 12, 15 hertz, not, not much more, right? So our muscle system finishes here. So the motor neurons are giving this input, but only this part uh, makes the muscle move. The other part is filtered out because the muscles cannot move it that, that fast. Mm? So one question you can ask yourself is, uh, why do we have this large bandwidth there? I mean, uh, I always say, if you had to design a, a, a controller for a motor, right, and the motor has a certain bandwidth, you would do the controller with an output that matches that bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So in the central nervous system, uh, the, the situation is different. You have the controller, which is the motor neuron, that provides an output in the spike train, an information on a, on a much larger bandwidth than the working principle of the motors, which are the buses. Mm -hmm. And now uh, comes the interesting question. Well, it, now in the view of augmentation, our natural tasks are all here, right? You cannot do a natural task that is outside this bandwidth because your muscles cannot move outside the bandwidth. But what if, uh, we take uh, this part uh, normally, and we, with this part, we control natural tasks. That's what, what happens normally, right? What if we try to use this bandwidth as an additional command or multiple additional commands, right? So we have power there, huh? and that uh, bandwidth doesn't uh, impact uh, the natural movements. So they are completely orthogonal because they are spectrally separated. But why don't we use this to control, for example, an additional R. Ah. All right, how, uh, I mean, uh, can we do that? Well, it depends. And, uh, and, and what is the condition for which we can use that uh, high bandwidth for augmentation? Well, the condition is that uh, our brain can control the power in this high frequency 
independently from the power of this low frequency, right? If the brain can control these two only together, then we cannot invent because to control the additional arm, we have to change the control of the natural arms. Mm -hmm. But if these two bandits can be controlled independently, then we have uh, from one single uh, command to a muscle, we split it in two. Mm -hmm. All right, is that possible? Well, first, uh, uh, this is uh, just parenthesis, the fact that, uh, because I said you can get high frequency in the motor neuron, we have seen that graph. You can get high frequency that corresponds to a number of uh, supraspinal activity. Mm -hmm. So here is an example of uh, a go no go trial. So the subjects maintain a certain force. They look at this cue. They know that here they will have a cue, but the cue can be go or no go. Go, they have to make a contraction. No go, they have to continue. And uh, when they have the no go, that is called uh, movement cancellation. Mm. So you expect you have to produce a movement, but you just you just continue. Mm. A movement cancellation. Uh, is uh, uh, associated to a very large uh, cortical activity, especially in the beta band. Mm -hmm. so the beta band seems to have, uh, as one uh, of the function, cortically to inhibit the motor command. But that uh, beta band inhibition goes down to motor neurons. So here you see a, 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 frequency, a frequency plot of motor neuron activity, and when there is cancellation, you have a very high frequency in the in the beta and part of the gamma band. So you can use motor neurons to look at cortical activity. You can use motor neurons as a brain interface, as a real brain interface. Mm -hmm. Now the idea is uh, this same beta activity that is, uh, for example, modulated in uh, in the motor cancellation can be modulated voluntarily if I give a feedback. Can we can we can we modulate it? Uh, and so can we control with that beta band and other signal? So this is again the work from Mario, where you have seen before for the motor units. This is another experiment that Mario Barakli did uh, in London, and it's the following. The coding motor neuron, and this time, instead of trying to control individual motor neurons, this time the, the full activity of the motor neuron, the full display train, is divided in two frequency bandwidths. One is around beta and one is below six. All right. This one is for natural movements, and this one is uh, this high frequency band that we don't know if it can be controlled. Mm -hmm. And the idea you can see is that uh, the, the power in the low frequency is associated to an axis, and the power in the high frequency is associated to the other axis. Mm -hmm. And uh, the subject is asked to explore this space. If the subject can explore this space, it means that these two bandwidths can be controlled independently, right? So you have two commands instead of one. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, the, the setup. This is one of the original papers of Mario showing this. And uh, these are the actual results. So this is the high frequency and low frequency. And these are trajectories of the cursor uh, of uh, uh, individual users. Mm -hmm. And now you can see that it's possible to reach these three targets. Huh? One uh, is the target where the two bandwidths are changing together, but the other two are targets in which only one of the two is changing. So the two bandwidths can be dissociated. Mm -hmm. So now you have a two-dimensional control. Actually, it's a, you, you can also make a principal component analysis, and you can find a two-dimensional control. And uh, from... Uh, one pool of motor neurons now that is receiving common input. So this pool is a pool for which we couldn't uh, separate motor units, but uh, the full pool has an high frequency content that we can separate from the low frequency content. So that common input that arrive is both a low and high frequency, but the two inputs at low and high frequency can, can be separated. Please. Yeah, it's just for uh, noise uh, in the in the actual uh, uh, cumulative spike train, but it would be very similar if you go to 10. Yeah, yeah, the, it's a good question. So before we say that, that the muscle bandwidth will be around 10, uh, yeah, you, you could repeat the experiments uh, around 10. This was for two reasons. One, to eliminate a bit of variability, 
in the, in the low-pass filtering of this. The other one is to have these two fully separated when you don't have uh, ideal filters, but that, that, that's a good question. Yeah. So, but in, uh, you can think that this, uh, if this was 10, uh, everything will save will be the same. Thank you for the question. So these two uh, frequencies can be uh, can be separated. And then you can ask yourself, all right, but can we make an, an additional proof that I can really not change the biomechanics and at the same time control an additional uh, command? Well, this is a, a second experiment uh, from Mario, the same study, in which uh, uh, you have a constant force uh, uh, activity. So the subject is asked to maintain force constant, and the force is identical, and then having uh, up modulation or down modulation of data. Mm -hmm. and when you do that a number of times and you compare, you have that indeed, the, when you ask the subject to up modulate, the, the beta power is higher. To down modulate the beta power is low. Now, this is a difficult task. It's not something that uh, that uh, can be done in a very precise way, but it's a proof of concept that, in principle, you could associate, while the subject is doing other things, you could associate a command, for example, to an external device. Mm -hmm. All right, now the interesting thing is to say, okay, when we done all this, does uh, how is the beta band in the motor neuron modulated? Is something really volitional? Does it come from the from the cortex? Uh, and uh, this is a thing that we discussed before, but uh, this is a, a study looking at that. So a study in which, uh, again, Mario looked uh, at the modulation of beta up and down in the motor neurons, and at the same time, you measure the EG. The EG is not used uh, as a feedback, but Mario looked at when we up modulate the beta, does it correspond to an increase in beta power in the EG? Mm -hmm. So that means we have biofeedback on the, on the spinal motor neurons, but the source of the modulation comes from the cortex. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, long, short, uh, long uh, story short, here you have uh, EG, and here you have the quid spike train of, uh, of motor neurons, and this is the beta power over time, and you can see that the two are not perfectly correlated because there is a lot of noise in between, but they have uh, uh, common uh, characteristics. And if you make a spike averaging uh, of the EG using the quality spike train or vice versa, you can see in the beta band, uh, in the beta band, common activity. Mm -hmm. So that means that uh, the, the narrow strategy to split the two bandwidth is indeed to modulate at the cortical level the beta band that is not impacting directly the functional command of the low frequency. Mm -hmm. And so that means that if uh, you ask the subject to modulate uh, through the CST, the commodity spike train, the amplitude, the duration, uh, and the number of bars per second uh, in, the, in the beta, uh, you have uh, similar changes in most of these features in the EG. Mm -hmm. So the EG is driving that beta down, and you pick it uh, from the motor neurons. So basically, in this experiment, what you are really doing uh, is to have uh, a brain interface that is not very different uh, than, uh, the, you remember the, the study on the monkey, the monkey was thinking of the same task, right? And we were picking brain activity, and this is, this is very similar. The only difference is that the brain activity is changing at the beta level, that's the power that we took, uh, Mm -hmm. is going down to the motor nerve, we, we can pick it from the motor nerve. So the motor nerve is making a brain interface that is producing augmentation in a very similar way as the monkey was uh, controlling the cursor with uh, cortical oscillation a certain, uh, in a certain band. Okay, I think we have finished this summary. Um, we, yeah, we, we are in a few, few minutes. Uh, this is a summary of everything of this uh, hour and a half of uh, discussion augmentation. So from the very beginning, we have discussed what is motor augmentation. I hope that this is one of the messages. It's very simple. Motor augmentation is in, it consists in increasing the motor capacities of humans. Uh, that means that the motor augmentation can be implemented in several ways. Huh? And we have seen a sort of a taxonomy of motor augmentation, power augmentation, extension of the, of the degrees of freedom and so on. We have started with a sort of an introductory example on bionics that was fun to discuss because uh, it's, uh, it's uh, quite advanced technology and uh, it, makes, uh, it made us 
reflecting a lot about the bioethics of this type of technologies. And then uh, we have uh, looked at the natural augmentation of individual with six fingers. And for those individuals, we have seen that the human nervous system, at least in those individuals, is able to develop a body and control multiple aesthetics of freedom without any upper and movement deficit, actually gaining functionality, right? And that is uh, the ideal motor augmentation that you would like to reach. You expand the motor capabilities uh, and uh, you have uh, that uh, kind of augmented part of the body as a full part of the body scheme. Mm. And then uh, we have seen uh, the example of the monkey study where brain activity can be used for motor augmentation. And then the second part has been uh, a bit more into motor neurons, uh, linking with the majority of the topics of this, uh, of this course. We have used the motor augmentation to discuss a theory of control of motor neurons in clusters, which is a good framework for studying augmentation. And we have discussed uh, what uh, may be done and what certainly cannot be done. So certainly you cannot have a single motor unit control independent from all others, but maybe you can have cluster control augmenting the normal command. And then uh, at the end, uh, we have also look at an alternative way from motor neurons uh, to, uh, to perform augmentation, which is using a uh, very unusually large bandwidth of the motor neurons with respect to the muscle assistant bandwidth, which is much smaller. So using the, that mismatch, maybe you can augment by using the information in the part of the bandwidth not used for, uh, for moving. And with this, thank you very much for the attention. I